Hello, everyone. We are going to have a pretty interesting meeting today. We have two exceptional presentations, uh, both very topical. One of the presentations today will be focused on how OpenChain ISO 5230 is working in projects. This is something that we've talked about for a while. The first post about this was written by Jonas Oberg, who works at Scania. And he was talking about how OpenChain, while originally targeted towards companies, could be adopted by any organization, including a project. And he proposed some ways that could happen. Now, until today, that has largely been a theoretical. Projects can use OpenChain. They can use this ISO standard for process management but we haven't had real world cases to discuss openly. That changes right now as Carlo Piana and Alberto Pianon talk about how two major projects are using OpenChain ISO 5230 to solve real world process management challenges. Our second presentation is going to be one of our exciting glimpses into another world. We're going to take a moment to learn about how governance around open innovation is happening in humanitarian deployments in the humanitarian sector. What happens, uh, there's an organization called Helpful Engineering that has done a lot of great work during the pandemic to bring some technologies to market that have assisted in the fight against the spread of COVID-19. What they do has involved various types of open innovation, and they'll cover that in a broad way to give us grounding in this interesting field. And they will also talk a little bit about an open source license compliance challenge in the field as well. So in essence, today we have one presentation about open chain going into a new sector, and that's huge. And then we have a presentation about how governance, something that Open Chain contributes to, is being managed in the humanitarian era. And of course, how license compliance works in that context. Let's get started with the real world project adoption of Open Chain ISO 5230. We're going to have Carlo and we're going to have Alberto talk about that. After they've completed their presentation, we're going to swing over and we're going to hear from Benjamin at Helpful Engineering about governance in humanitarian deployments and learn a little bit more about the case study they have about open source license compliance challenges. So Carlo, Alberto, I will hand over to you uh, and the baton is yours for the next 30 minutes. Thank you, Shane. This is Carlo Piana. I hope you hear me fine. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's uh, something we have already presented on, but never in uh, this uh, new, um, um, under this new hat of a project that is going to be a fully um, a foundation owned. So not a company owned uh, project as it was at the beginning, but actually a, a, a project that is aimed to be uh, within a foundation totally controlled by users, by uh, stakeholders, not by one single entity. So this has been, is going to be a real challenge because this process has uh, just started. We have identified a foundation which is going to receive, and I, I will get to that in a moment. Um, I would just briefly describe the kind of challenges that we have faced so far and what lies ahead. We have made some progress, some inroads, but uh, still it's, uh, it's, it's a work in progress. So uh, without any further ado, I'm trying to, to switch to my presentation, if I can, uh, just a second. All right, all right. You should be seeing my presentation and if I share the screen, of course. Okay. It is displaying perfectly. It is? Okay. 
Thank you. All right, then um, uh, this is still saying open harmony. It, actually, it's not uh, the 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 name of the project is not open harmony. Uh, it's uh, it's a new it's a new pro it's a new name, but it 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 comes from open harmony. Uh, what we have uh, decided to do, uh, what uh, actually Huawei. The, the the sponsor of the his entire operation has decided to do is to bring a, uh, a to the world a fully open uh, uh, OS uh, with uh, compliance uh, in these uh, in his uh, blood. So um, uh, it open chain. Uh, it was uh, since the beginning one fundamental building block. So. Um, th we have we have been involved for, from day zero in the project. And we have uh, been involved in all the all the steps, including uh, before the the project was handed over uh, to a, a an external front foundation. This uh, wants to be an example for others, for uh, how compliance should be done in a project, not as an afterthought, but um, uh, as a fundamental block of of the entire project. Uh, Open, uh, open harmony, all scenarios as, uh, and, and that would have an, another name uh, really soon, is basically an, a, a multi-kernel OS dedicated to the low-end devices, portable devices, uh, IoT devices. It's uh, ba basically, it can run on Linux, it can, can run on, on other kernels, but uh, it's the, this is the space uh, it go, it, it's going to, to be in. It's um, it's based on Yocto. Yocto, with all its uh, hydrosyncrasies, it, its its uh, quirks, is uh, the building environment, and that brings a lot of uh, of issues for for compliance. This is not new to many of you who, who are uh, already working on Yocto, but we have seen and we have considered many of these uh, challenges. Um, we have different stakeholders in 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 uh, in the oper op uh, in the operating system, and we have uh, enrolled different target different platforms that are uh, specifically targeted by the by the system. So the system builds for these different targets. So we have different code bases. Largely, they share the code base, but they have their own uh, their own versions in in the repositories of of the, of the operating system, and uh, that adds complexity to something which is already very complex. We are speaking of many thousand packages, all in one single. It's not a very, it's not a simple project. It has uh, the, the 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 components that are built. Uh, as a first party, uh, patches that are built to uh, other uh, third parties projects, plus all the, the entire image that we build. And we build the image for in, uh, each and any uh, target platform, as, as I said before. So uh, how this uh, was, was made and, and who are the, the uh, protagonists of this uh, journey? It started, as I said, as an internal project of Huawei. They had to start a new operating system, uh, but uh, it was called Harmony OS, but it's not that anymore. It has been redone from scratch. So uh, it was uh, Christianized as Open Harmony, and into to cut the, uh, the, 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 the legacy, it has been renamed All Scenario OS, which is a working title. And it, it uh, soon it will be announced in its uh, uh, final name, hopefully. And um, since the beginning, uh, the aim was to uh, not to build, uh, the, to create the operating system as an internal uh, project, but it was conceived to be donated, to be uh, taken over by a foundation. And the Eclipse Foundation, it's not still not official, but it's uh, the cat is uh, out of the bag, has been uh, selected as the hosting entity for uh, for the project. That alone is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge because 
Of course, uh, Eclipse has a strong IP management uh, uh, workflow. They have rules. And so we have to, um, to mix and match what they are doing with what we are doing, the way we are doing. But they are very keen to um, uh, go in, in the field of open, um, um, open chain and, uh, and this kind of approach, of integrated approach to, to uh, compliance and conformance. The working group, uh, namely, uh, many, uh, including Array, of course, but many um, um, con contributors have uh, already joined, and they will be joining an official working group at, at, at Eclipse when when the the, the project will will be kickstarted. But the, we are already working together to to create and to bring uh, the operating system uh, forward. Um, and the development team, the people who are actually uh, writing code has, have been fully briefed since day zero. So um, they know uh, the requirements, they have uh, been uh, educated on IP, on compliance, and they are fully aboard uh, on, on this project. This is very important. We have stressed this very much because uh, it, it um, we see conformance not as a legal issue or organizational reason, but issue, but a, 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 an overarching uh, an overarching um, uh, issue for the entire uh, the entire being. Noi Tech Park of Bolzano has um, been um, uh, retained us array for the compliance code slash conformance base. So we are working closely with the entire team. So this is the cast of characters more or less and history in a nutshell of the project. Uh, um, we have uh, no surprise using scan code and phosology together uh, for, for scanning, but scanning is just the first uh, step of our, of our tool chain. Um, we are trying and building uh, these as a component in, in, in a CICD way. So we are defining the, the uh, triggering rules for, uh, for triggering the, the, the scans and, 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 uh, and because you, you, uh, this takes a lot of time. It's a very complex uh, uh, project with hundred uh, with possibly gigabytes of code to be to be scanned. So uh, we have to be wise when the, uh, uh, the the scanning occurs because it takes days. And so we are selecting how uh, frequently uh, the, the the entire scan is, uh, needs needs to be done. Um, the audit team is already uh, working, but uh, we see that the human uh, in interaction, the human um, review of the scan results is not sufficient. And so we have developed what we call Alien, alien for Friends. Uh, we come to that uh, a, a, a moment later, but this is a very important bit that we are adding and trying to uh, contribute back to the community as a, uh, a as a, a a, a way to facilitate the auditing, um, the auditing um, process, and of course we are using SPDX uh, as a standard for uh, interchanging uh, services and information through the different bits of the pipeline. We are uh, have decided to intensely reuse reuse as a standard for declaring um, uh, the legal information, the licensing information uh, of each file in the first party, and ideally also for the third party uh, part code that we are uh, creating and contributing to. And we're not using clearly defined, not because we don't like it, we like it very much. Besides, it's a project um, uh, heavily uh, rooted into, into Eclipse, but uh, they are working in a different space and so, um, at this juncture, uh, there is no benefit in using that. Um, there is nothing. So we uh, prefer to use Edin for friends uh, and not clearly defined. And finally, we are creating something new, which is a dashboard, because given, given the complexity, a simple report will not be very useful. So we are creating a dashboard for showing and telling what is the status of compliance at that point. And Alberto will, will speak uh, more uh, extensively on that. So, uh, 
uh, we have uh, just just a few words on why it ends up friends. So phosology does a lot of things, and scanners do a lot of things, but they do uh, uh, they, these in uh, um, they are miss, missing bits. Um, it's not a very comprehensive tool, but it it, it can be at the, at the center of, of our project. But we had to develop something more. Uh, it requires a lot of human work, and the uh, and, and given the the magnitude of the of the problems, we don't have workforce. We will need many, probably hundreds of men days, and that's not uh, co compatible to our um, to our um, timeline. So we have to do, we have to take some, not shortcuts, but we have to take some clever moves. And what we uh, are this, have decided to do is do it the open source way, avoiding to uh, avoiding uh, reinventing the wheel, reusing other others' work, uh, but not just others' work, not other uh, decisions about. Um, licensing but some someone we trust and who we trust best is uh, is uh, is Debian. Debian does a very uh, excellent work uh, is not 100% what we need but what they do is very very useful to us and they have uh, very very clever uh, and very extensive very detailed um, and reliable um, information also for um, with um, um, metadata and uh, they present this information in a machine readable way so we can reuse them in, in a very uh, efficient way. Uh, it's not everything. Um, not, all, um, not always we find a full match. So finding the, the right match in Debian is not uh, always possible and it's demanding. And this has been a, a part of the work that we have done um, uh, investing a lot of time. Uh, not all the packages are there and not everything is machine readable. But uh, then again, using that has helped us to save uh, a lot of time. Uh, so we are close to 100% uh, uh, the package uh, um, fully vetted and, and, and audited. And that would have been impossible with the workforce we are employing. So as I said, we have decided also to, uh, uh, to reuse, reuse, pardon for the, 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 the wording, but, uh, um, so um, we are, um, are uh, also uh, implementing, uh, we are also implementing HOHO, I, th I hope it's pronounced correctly, but a, uh, is a dedicated phosology agent that we use for, for, for years. Uh, and this is this is some, just a, a general description of uh, what we do and what we are. I've, I've taken uh, more than I was planning to, to, to take for, for this initial uh, general introduction. Uh, and I think I can safely pass uh, the floor uh, to my uh, partner, Robert. So I hope he, he or, you are there and, and, and fully uh, prepared to, to take on. So thank you, Alberto. Hello. So Alberto, you hello? just need to unmute. Uh, hello, uh, hello everybody. Hi. Do, do you see my screen? We can see your screen. Your okay. voice is a little bit quiet. Quiet. So let me increase the volume. Is that Perfect. okay? Okay. So uh, I will start from, from the bottom, from, from the last step uh, that uh, Carlo mentioned before, the dashboard. Uh, because uh, it shows uh, in a nutshell uh, uh, all the works that uh, we are doing in the background. Um, uh, the uh, challenge we have to face with this project is that we don't have, like in many common uh, situations, uh, uh, a single Yocto project or a bunch of Yocto projects uh, 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 that are targeted at different uh, consumer devices. We have a, a, a big uh, Yocto project uh, that has many variants, uh, different flavors, uh, different kernels, uh, 
the, the, all those variants share a, a bunch of uh, core components. Uh, uh, they have uh, special components, uh, basically for, for hardware support and other functionalities. So uh, we uh, wanted to redu reduce complexity and have something that showed us uh, the, the progress on the compliance work on the overall uh, project. Uh, so uh, here you, you see uh, the, the work that is ongoing in Fosology. We have an audit team that is doing what uh, uh, the, the is the, the work that we didn't uh, manage to, to, um, to do by leveraging uh, the Debian machine tool that we developed. Uh, you see that we are on track. Uh, there is uh, still a 10% of code to, to be audited, but, uh, but uh, I will be soon uh, uh, completed. And um, we assess the provenance of the code and uh, uh, we have uh, a, no, a known provenance of each package for, for almost uh, all, all the, the code that we include. Uh, we, uh, for statistical purposes, we, we, we have the licenses that are being detected by license scanners, uh, the main license for each package, and the license that uh, are the results of the, the audit uh, work on Fosology and also uh, on Debian uh, matching, uh, uh, from, from the Debian matching part. Uh, as you can see here, we are still on an early stage, but we have already 15 machines, uh, target machines. Uh, we have 14 image, different images. Uh, we have five different diff distros. Uh, we have, uh, uh, yes, more than 1, 1 million files, uh, source files, uh, and um, uh, here you, you can see uh, the details for, for each package that is included. Uh, and uh, also to, to reduce complexity, we, we, have, we are developing a way to, uh, mer uh, to aggregate um, variants, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the problem that we have uh, is that Yocto uh, uh, don't, don't, doesn't have a real package manager. Uh, uses uh, a recipe slash layer system. Uh, so uh, when you have a, a version of the package, uh, it usually is uh, just uh, the upstream version uh, of the package, but all the downstream patches, bug fixes, uh, CV fixes uh, are something that are not uh, uh, reflected in the, in the version. So we are trying to, to map uh, all this complexity uh, because, for instance, you can have uh, slightly different uh, uh, source files uh, for, uh, depending on the target machine. So we are we are trying to, or, or you, you can have uh, some uh, CVE patches added over time, uh, even if the version is the same. So we are trying to map uh, all this complexity, not only for compliance reasons, but also for to monitor security vulnerabilities and also. Uh, to monitor more generally uh, the, the health status of each package. So we, we are planning to integrate uh, this also with the metadata coming from, from other projects like uh, the Chaos project uh, by Linux Foundation. And uh, in order to have uh, a, a, an overall picture for each package uh, uh, of the compliance status, the security status, the bug fix status, uh, and so on. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the front end. Uh, the back end is uh, a little bit uh, complex. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 the workflow in a nutshell, but I, I cannot go into detail here. But uh, as you can see, we, we, have, uh, we have many steps uh, that we uh, are, uh, ma have managed to automate. And now we are uh, doing the work to, to, to insert all this uh, workflow into a CI pipeline. And, um, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the audit, uh, the human audit activity here in the middle. So we have uh, an async process uh, uh, that needs to be managed uh, uh, with the CI pipeline. So there is a little bit of complexity that we are trying to, to, uh, to, to handle. And um, uh, the, 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 this whole tool chain, uh, is uh, of course uh, all open source, uh, and uh, you can find uh, in the uh, Huawei OSTC uh, GitLab uh, uh, server, and the address is uh, this one. If you can, if it's visible, I hope so, and uh, I can uh, paste it on the chat for whoever is willing to to, 
to have a look. And, um, and basically that's it. Uh, if you have, if anyone has questions uh, or remarks uh, or is willing to collaborate, we are open to any external contribution. So it seems like uh, we have a lot going on in what you and Carlo presented. Uh, to open, um, I've got a question which I think primarily goes to Carlo, but perhaps both of you could cover. It sounds like um, what's happening with Open Harmony and what's happening with uh, support of these goals is a major step forward in trying to make sure that, uh, for example, an operating system that can be utilized across multiple devices has extremely strong uh, process management and practical tools are uh, available, easy to use, um, easy to understand. Uh, I have a question about the leak news <laughs> regarding uh, Eclipse Foundation uh, and what happens next. From what David posted in our chat, I understand that the announcements will be in September. So we're very close to some big announcements formally about what's happening with Open Harmony. And it supports not just Linux, but also Zephyr and FreeRTOS. Um, I suppose it's a little bit early to ask this, uh, but it seems like the positioning is extremely global. So, you know, it's, it's obviously far bigger than the original optics, which were you know, Huawei's OS. Um, and it seems like there's obviously a lot of work in the background. Um, I just wanted to check what state of maturity is the community itself at? You know, Carlo said that there's a community being built. Uh, it was always designed to have a community. And I, I just wanted to get a feel for how big that community is out of the game. Yep, so, so, so Shane, this is David. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, good, I can answer that question. So, uh, so with regard to all the clips, uh, the clip says, uh, uh, it's a gate uh, and checkpoints for launching a project. Uh, so uh, we have now into the uh, incubation phase. Uh, so using Eclipse terminology, you require an Eclipse member, uh, in this case Huawei, to initiate the project. Once the project has been initiated, now you're moving into the next four phases before you go mass production. Typically it takes between 12 to 18 months to receive mass production uh, or general availability, if you will. And uh, the next gate from initiation to uh, the next one, which I don't remember what's the name of the phase, requires the working group to be set up. And it does require the other members to join the working group. And right now we have six, uh, including Huawei, uh, that are already participating in the development work. Uh, so effectively what happened is that we were waiting for Eclipse to complete their move to Europe, because uh, Eclipse is now a, a European-based uh, foundation. And since we couldn't wait, you, you know, given the pandemic and COVID and all that stuff, effectively we went ahead and with the existing members started developing the infrastructure, everything that Carlo has described, the technology. So we're well into almost one year of development with an active community that sees about 30 to 35 active developers, uh, constant developers, on and off developers. The community counts about 100 to 150, uh, you know, supporters coming in and out. And as I said before, six members. Uh, so as soon as we move into the next phase, the announcement to be done in September, uh, the hope is that by the end of the year, we're going to hit two other members. So we're going to be at eight by the end of the year. And then so we're going to be measuring the activity of the group by the number of design makers, CPU vendors, and ODMs that will join as the members, pay members and active vendors, members of the community. We're going to be measuring the success of the activity by the number of design wins. So meaning the devices that will go in production with the, the code of the project uh, as the base OS. And we're going to be measuring the uh, community health uh, in terms of contributors, active contributors, number of people that just get, are curious, uh, conferences that we speak to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want a soft uh, metrics and health criteria to see how the community uh, evolves over time and, and, and uh, you know, how much, uh, you know, the world speaks of the project itself. 
So this is kind of in a nutshell where we are and where we're headed. Uh, now, it must be said that I come from Wonderver and Intel, and I was one of the uh, funding fathers of both the Yasuo project, was one of the initiators of Zephyr. And so the way that we measure this project is known different from the way that we would measure Yasuo project or Zephyr. Number of active members, number of design wins over time. And if we do our job right, three to five years from now, we will see about 20 to 25 paying active members, which is typically where this project plateau. Uh, because there is, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. And then there's tens and tens of members that are not paying or not active members, but that are using the project for their device. Okay. So this is in a nutshell, hopefully the answer to your question. That is fantastic to know. Obviously, uh, this is going to be a huge part of where we see uh, activity in Q4 and into 2022. Very cool. I have a question now on the uh, aliens for friends, <laughs> which um, seems really exciting. Uh, my, my question related to this is that from the screenshots you showed me, this appears to fill a gap uh, where, you know, open source SCA has been lacking. Uh, the support of both Fossology and scan code uh, is exactly the type of dashboard effect that we need in open source tools for open source compliance to compete with proprietary um, SCA solutions. Uh, I, I guess my question is, uh, SPDX is about to be published as an ISO standard. Uh, does the existing version, the supported version of scan code and Fossology support SPDX? Um, and are you amenable to collaborating with others to uh, support other tools in the future? Um. I am well. Uh, as probably some of you already know, uh, the the SPDX support, uh, especially by Fossology, is not one hundred percent accurate. So we have uh, a final step when we uh, take all the SPDX data from Fossology and from ScanCode, and we like uh, cure it and 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 fix uh, all the the inconsistencies uh, and um, some there are some deprecated. Uh, uh, specifications that are implemented by by Fossology, we fix that, and uh, uh, for for now we we cope the, with the problem in this way. We we fix uh, the 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 SPDX uh, uh, that is output by by Fossology in order that is fully SPDX compliant, and um, uh, in the future we may try to to also to. To add uh, other other tools, uh, um, for for sure we will uh, uh, implement some tools uh, to to do uh, uh, an automatic policy checking, uh, such as uh, ORT. But uh, this is still on the backlog because we are um, uh, for now we are trying to to close the the, the pipeline thing in order to to have. Uh, uh, a seamless uh, process uh, uh, be, between the development team and the audit team, uh, and then uh, see monitor results in the dashboard. But the next step would be for sure to, to use other tools, uh, integrate other tools uh, for for the especially for the automatic uh, check of licensing compatibilities and uh, other other issues. That's great. And just for context for people who aren't really familiar with uh, what's going on with SPDX. In the market, we see, especially in Japan, companies interested in a subset of SPDX. Uh, SPDX 2.2 is what's becoming the ISO standard. And in Appendix um, 8, there's a thing called SPDX Lite, which is a very small subset of SPDX identifiers. Uh, and in practice, many companies are finding this sufficient for initial supply chain management. So, you know, hopefully we'll see all of the tools supporting SPDX Lite um, as a starting point, which should get adoption pretty quickly. Carlo, I see your hand is up. Over to you. Yeah, um, just chiming on on, uh, on reusing information or on decisions. Um, this has been a recurring uh, item of discussion. So why doesn't people, why don't people share their uh, their findings? Why don't people do, don't people share their, um, uh, their information? And, and forcing other projects to do reinventing the wheel over and over again with a, a great, uh, uh, a great uh, waste of time and, and energies. So we have decided not just to reuse uh, decisions made by Debian, 
but the entire the entire code base that we are sharing will also be shared in the form of a reusable um, software bill of materials. So uh, everybody is invited to reuse, of course, at their own decision, at their own risk. But um, this is something which is, is going to be an important contribution back. Uh, I think we are we can improve. Uh, the decision already made on, on, on package licensing, and we can provide a, a useful, very useful for, for just for the sheer amount of package that we are vetting through our um, uh, scanning and, and auditing process that will be contributed back, which is uh, uh, apart from Debian, which is a foundation uh, for for, um, for 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 Linux, uh, this is the first time uh, this kind of uh, this with this uh, uh, dimensions uh, this a software bill of material will be shared with all the information possible. That's really exciting. Uh, there's a few things in the pipeline for open chain as well along this line. So later this month, we'll probably have more to talk about. Okay, so we have another question in. Um, David asked, David Marr asked if uh, is what's happening with the Open Harmony project Eclipse a replacement for Open Harmony as we know it or fork or branch? Uh, David wanted to jump in and answer that. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I'll take 30 seconds because I know you need to move to the to the next one, uh, Shane. So, and I think it kind of uh, connects back to your question about the global uh, scope that I didn't address directly. Uh, so, so very shortly, the trajectory of the project. So Huawei started the Harmony brand. Uh, so Harmony is Huawei's proprietary, if you want, if you will, commercial brand for uh, consumer devices products that runs the Harmony operating system. Right, so whether that's a mobile, that's a tablet, that's a laptop, there's a speaker, there's just a watch, whatever, right? So at some point, and, and the project started back uh, four or five years ago, uh, before the rumblings with the expert trade and, and the Trump administration and so forth. Uh, that accelerated the donation of some of the code base to the project named Open Harmony. The project named Open Harmony belonged to a Chinese open source foundation that was created I think slightly more than one year ago, uh, and, and you know, under the attempt uh, of, of China to establish a, an important reference point for open source projects inside China territory and for China companies. And most of the activity there is done in Chinese, and some of the code is in Chinese, some of it's in English, et cetera, et cetera. So Open Harmony, which was the initial donation from the Harmony code from Huawei, was donated to the Open Atom Foundation, and now we have an Open Harmony project inside the Open Atom Foundation. And that fosters and nurture mostly the Chinese market. So Chinese device maker, ODMs, and so forth. We lack a global, uh, or using Huawei's terminology, oversee market uh, foundation that would actually promote uh, development, adoption, and so forth in, 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 you know, in, in, for known Chinese device maker, known Chinese ODM. And this is where the Exclave Foundation uh, comes in. So effectively, you're going to be looking at two projects one run by Open Atom Foundation and one run by Eclipse, one with the scope in China and the other one with the global scope. The two foundations will collaborate and collaborate together to promote one ecosystem. But at the same time, the two ecosystems are different. So device makers are different. They tend you know, to you know, have different requirements that may be more localized, et cetera, et cetera. So the two distributions or two projects, if you will, they will share uh, some codes, a good base. They will share an Open Armory compatibility uh, specification and, and test toolkit so that if you build a device in Europe and you want Chinese application or Japanese application to run onto that device that is being manufactured in Germany, you'll be able to sell it there. But then at that point, take the application built for that specific geography or ecosystem and running on that device. So a compatibility at the application level, but at the same time, the two project ecosystem will have flexibility, autonomy, and the ability to move at their own speed and promote their own requirements. Right. So, so that is the, uh, the trajectory that we've taken and, and, and how the two foundation will cooperate, at least on paper. A lot of work, but that's the idea. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so for some parties on the call, I think are relatively new to this field. Uh, what happens in the Chinese domestic market in terms of app stores and services is often pretty different to what happens in, let's say, the U.S. market. 
Uh, so this fits very much into the pattern of where we see Android um, and the Android open source project. Okay, and Open Atom, for people who don't know it, is uh, a really communicative uh, foundation. Uh, we've had events with them with OpenChain. Uh, so they're very easy to approach. And naturally, if you want to do something in the Chinese language space, uh, they're great people to talk to. So it sounds like Eclipse for, you know, outside of Chinese language and Open Atom for uh, Chinese language area in, in a in, broad indeed. stroke. Yeah. In, indeed. So, so say that you are an Italian device maker, your natural place to go for uh, open harmony compatible devices for a global market is Eclipse. And then you could choose to actually also participate in open atom work, but naturally you would tend to gravitate around Eclipse and, and vice versa for, you know, an Alibaba or Tencent or Xiaomi or any other company that wants to play uh, that would join open atom. Well, we've had a lot to digest here. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, David. So while our heads are still spinning from what is now a massive global uh, activity, uh, which has open chain ISO 5230 process management, uh, we are going to take a deep breath and dive into humanitarian aid. <laughs> so I'm going to pass over to Benjamin. Uh, thank you for your patience and waiting. As you can imagine, uh, we are, you know, obsessive about where the ISO standard is going. So we were very excited about this, but we're also excited about hearing how new sectors are doing stuff. And helpful engineering has really been extraordinarily active in the last year in actually bringing solutions to market. So we're looking forward to hearing about that. And then also hearing about what you hinted as an interesting compliance challenge. Thanks for having us, Shane. Uh, so I'm Benjamin Treuhoft. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of Helpful, which is a small not-for-profit. I'm going to start with that story uh, and, uh, and, and sort of introduce you I, to Helpful that way, because we were built uh, as a spontaneous kind of emerging response to the COVID pandemic, and we very much built our car going 100 miles down the road without any tires or wheels as we were doing it. So uh, it's been quite a wild ride to, to, realize, uh, uh, to realize this. Uh, it, so I'm gonna begin with this story, which is true. So once upon a time, we had a bug in our world and it made a lot of people very sick everywhere. And people met online to figure out what to do about it because they knew it was going to break everything and people weren't going to have what they needed. So they went to work in as efficient a way as possible and they didn't have a great deal to work with, nothing at all really. No real resource, no big machines, no big business behind them. These were just ordinary folk and everyday people. The one thing these people did know how to do was design and make things. They made a simple thing first, just a PDF explaining how you sew a mask yourself, but with proper materials engineering so that it did what it was supposed to do. The next thing they put out was a little bit more complicated, a face shield you could quickly produce on a laser cutter. All you needed was the vector file, the readme, and a simple sheet of PET plastic. And it was important that everybody could get this really fast and easy. So they threw a CERN strongly reciprocal license on it, packaged it up and started telling everybody where to find it. People everybody, everywhere made this thing. They made it at home and in schools and maker spaces and people who designed the shield didn't care about the money. They did it because it was the most efficient way they could do something and deliver it everywhere and anywhere fast uh, that anybody could make it. And there were lots of laser cutters out there and lots of PET plastic. The same people went to manufacturers to try to get the thing made at scale, but manufacturers didn't really understand how to handle this interaction. It's free, like there are no royalties. Uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not how we work. Uh, this was incredibly confusing, especially to the folks who made the thing to be helpful in the context of the pandemic. And the manufacturers were saying, there must be a catch that's going to cause me a problem somewhere down the road. I don't understand this license. I don't understand how it works. Uh, this is going to cost me a lot of money later. You're, 
not a credible entity producing this innovation and there's no patent and I, somebody's going to sue me. So no. The helpful people said, look, there's no catch. Just please make the thing go ahead, make money on it. Uh, we know times are hard for you as well as everybody else, but if you just observe the terms of the license and credit us there, that's all you got to do. The Shield got out there anyway, and lots of people made it. It got pressed in the Times, uh, and people would have stopped and laughed about it because the Times called them all renegade engineers, which was very funny, except the engineers were too busy, and so they went off and solved other bug-related problems. Uh, 18 months later, this group of folks who'd been working all this time decided to catch their breath and stop and take stock and looked around at what they'd actually accomplished. And lo and behold, as they searched around the web looking for tracks and traces of their various projects, more than 40 that have been spun up, uh, they saw that a bunch of manufacturers had actually picked up this design and made tons and tons of them. Did they make 20 million? 30, 80 million, it was really kind of hard to tell from the metrics manufacturers were posting on the websites. They were not very coherent. It wasn't very clear, but what was clear is that lots of these things got made and some people observed the terms of this license and others did not. It's a strange thing to rip off a free thing. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, we don't know how this story is going to end or what it means, but it's an interesting segue into the subject of open source compliance around licensing and the governance of it in the context of moving a solution rapidly to, uh, to, to, you know, to where it's needed for supply and demand. Uh, and, and this is really very interesting to solve. We've been working on all of these things as we do work across supply chains and, uh, and try to manage what we are, uh, you know, what we're, what we're delivering aid to people where they need it really very quickly, which is mostly in the form of simple technology solutions and designs. I see a hand up. Ben, you're, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I apologize. Well, at that point I was just talking. So sorry. Oh, Mish. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, let me introduce you to Helpful Engineering. Um, uh, and please tell me if you're able to see my screen. Is this working? Uh, Pray not. No? Okay. Hang on a second. Uh, you. No, it's still not working. Great. That's terrific. Mish, how do I do this? If necessary, you can also send me your slides and I can share them. I think that might be the way to do this. All right. One, one quick moment. I just saw. Uh, Apologies, everybody, for the wait. This was unexpected. No problem at all. I just saw King jumped in on the chat. Uh, he had some notes uh, on the <laughs> Gitty page that I shared earlier. Uh, there is a little icon in the lower left, which is advertising a compliance meetup uh, this Friday in Shenzhen, or in Japan we call it Shenzhen. And uh, that is, I believe, King, that's a face-to-face -face meeting. And the open, open chain dominates the schedule there, <laughs> as in so many other events. So if you happen to be in Shenzhen, not only can you go to an excellent meetup, um, you can enjoy the local cuisine, and of course, hang out with King. Shane, you should have it. Ready, just checking if I've got that email. Still waiting for the arrival. Okie dokie, I got it. Just Great. opening it now. 
All right, here weird. we go, sharing. I went through this earlier to make sure that it worked, and for some reason now it doesn't. <laughs> Just tell me when to move on on the slides. Okay, well, so we're quite literally, a, you know, as an organization, a case study uh, in what compliance is and what rapid innovation looks like and supply chain study. We can go to the next one. So what is helpful to introduce you what we are? Uh, oops, back one, sorry, Shane. Um, it's really helpful is really a platform that consists of communities enabling partnerships operating within frameworks uh, and it's a it's a really rather unique thing in the sense that we built ourselves under these incredibly stressful conditions and actually functioned when other things kind of weren't functioning so uh, a crisis state would seem like our normal state and way of doing things um, and one interesting aspect of this platform is that it provides this space for like-minded uh, and interested individuals to meet and brainstorm about anything that they think is interesting or can be done better. And it's rare to find such a space where you have such a broad interdisciplinary representation of expertise that gets together and looks and discusses one another's work. It's not just engineers, you have business people here, scientists, it's, uh, it's like if you took the executives from uh, many large companies and Bell Labs and, uh, and then, uh, you know, some really smart folks from Boeing and GE and, and everybody else and put them all together in a room and, and said, like, hey, how do we do something really interesting that's really useful? Um, and the real challenge in all of this is how do we capture this massive exchange of information around the development of a solution, especially... Uh, in the in the in the context of rapid of rapidly producing solutions, so that you can get what you need, or what you produce, what people need, where they need it, when they need it, as fast as possible, and make sure it's all safe, and that it works within what I like to call the mechanisms of the world. It has the traceability that it meet and it meets the requirements, whether of a funder. Uh, a, a regulatory environment or a regulatory agency, um, uh, you know, business needs that it is sustainable in the current context of what all of that is considered today. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So helpful story is that, as I said, we spun up during pandemic to address supply chain shortage, it's specifically in medical through engineering rigor. Uh, the platform scaled to 13,000 in about three weeks, and it's more than 19,000 folks have passed through our door today contributing. It's really, as I said, this convergence of scientists, technologists, engineers, doctors. And we organically evolved our innovation model, which is now seems pretty well proven and, and pretty effective in getting things out. So we've had projects that have been downloaded many millions of times, produced many millions of times at market, and these scale range of whether software or hardware uh, addressing uh, needs in this medical space. We have solutions enabling vaccine scheduling. We have supported vaccine programs and automation and, and data processing here in New York City, where I live, uh, because that was a very cumbersome and difficult process for small organizations that don't have access to uh, advanced technology to facilitate the recording of a dose. Uh, but we've also been producing things like ventilators and, and innovations and technology around that and that things people can make anywhere trying to get the cost of these things down. We, as a matter of fact, have one team that went back to the drawing board and using fluid dynamics delivered a design that is proven effective on the bench anyway and this hasn't been human tested. Uh, but it would cost $10 a unit, a ventilator that costs $10 a unit. It's not something you want to keep somebody on, but it does work. It's really quite interesting that people, what people can do when they go back to the roots of things and really re-engineer uh, uh, proven things that have come before. Um, this has resulted in some nice coverage. And we're currently now building out this platform uh, and so that we can build and deploy solutions uh, across different communities and across industries and industry sectors. Uh, so right now we're focused on this platform development, the community building and our solution development and support processes that need to go along with making any solution sustainable. The sectors that we currently operate in are of course medical, but we also have been doing a great deal of work in examining supply chains issues there uh, with why did things break down Looking, and now we're starting to expand into food chain with 
looking an eye towards energy and other environmental impact function uh, uh, concerns. But sustainability from all aspects, from all dimensions, is a key element of our design uh, ethos, if you will. And it goes from the input of a solution through the through the execution and into the business model of the organization, the entity itself. And even in an aid context, which is what we currently really do, this is a critical thing because if you're a government or a, a donor, even uh, a foundation, a charitable organization, you want your dollar to be as multi-use as possible. Uh, so that means you don't want a, a disposable Band-Aid you want something that will scaffold and build and create a, a greater capacity and infrastructure to present problems in the future. Next, please. So our initial portfolio, of course, focuses on global health needs. And our mission and vision is to deliver openly engineered solutions everywhere. And we want to see a world where you can, everybody has a greater access to resource and opportunity that uh, increases the innovation that exists in the world, stability and prosperity. And we see that as something that can be leveraged for enormous global benefit. Uh, and healthcare is a great example of how we can do this. For example, a low middle income might need a ventilator. They won't buy an expensive one because they can't afford it. And they won't accept an expensive proprietary one, even as aid, because they can't afford to maintain it. They can't afford to train to use it. They can't buy the parts. They won't offshore scarce specie. But what if they can repair the thing themselves at a local university using a 3D printer, additive or subtractive technologies that they already have and know how to use, that they'll do. That's a whole different ballgame. They'll accept that aid. So let's abstract that. Think about it, whether in a food chain, how they farm, production of housing. All of a sudden, it's a different thing if we think this way. That's aid that people will accept. Uh, and if you think about this at scale, we can easily imagine how planting these sorts of seeds of technologies or transferring these open technologies into these environments creates capacity, it supports a population. And from a few simple tools, it begins to result in infrastructure that provides for basic needs like healthcare, food, clean food and water and shelter, all of things that lead to the reduction of human stress. Because when there is enough of these basic needs, and reduce the competition of resource around them. And then it becomes about competing for better versions of them, which is a different thing. And all of this in turn results in stability and reduced threat, whether this is ecological, biological, social, cultural, or governmental. You build the economy at the same time, which means new markets for industries that participate in this total model. You innovate, you make that open, you transfer the technology, and then you fund small manufacturing locally. Design globally, build locally. So it's always seemed a shame to me that more of this isn't done because it's odd to me to forego the many billions of people that don't participate in the current uh, economic systems of the world. Next slide, please. So, the way we're positioning to bring these ideas to realization through aid uh, and, 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 and out into the world is through this model of aggregating communities and serving as kind of a federation function. So whether these are crowdsource challenges, uh, you know, local initiatives that are underway, ideation and concept platforms, hackathons, other maker communities and various invention and innovation communities, finding that lowest common denominator provide and what what is the infrastructure there look like because all these things kind of need the same things they need some common tooling or at least similar tooling that outputs common data and they need communications and they need to be able to find demand what is the real challenge understand the requirements that the solution will go into and that has to be sort of integrated all of that has to be assembled and put together in a way that then becomes understandable to funder, regulatory, distributor, uh, manufacturer, uh, and there has to be the compliance in government. Some trouble with file music. Oh, sorry. Uh, and how that all gets assembled then with uh, uh, in such a way that, that it can reach the people that actually need it and become a sustainable new business 
a sustainable piece of aid, a sustainable solution, and grow a market and create the stability that we just discussed. Next, please. So that's a really our unique proposition and how we've gone about looking at this. And what we've learned in the context of this pandemic is really needed. It's about having this big, healthy ecosystem to source not only solutions, but figure out where the demand is and the unique challenges around them, and then figure out how to make them talk together in a vertically integrated way, resulting in from, from, from the sourcing of that problem to the delivery and the deployment of the solution and the integration of all the requirements and things that go in between. Next, please. So why do this now? Why is this the right time to undertake uh, this extension of a global innovation pipeline? Uh, because these things exist and they exist at scale, but we're trying to push things even further in some ways. Uh, and there's really two big reasons around it, why it's time to do the next iteration of this in the physical domain, where there's places that might already do it exceptionally well in the digital. And these are that COVID, as bad as it was, and everybody, COVID was definitely an enormous problem. But the bigger problem is that nothing worked. And that's really a significant thing. Supply chain broke. And why did it break? It's because people couldn't figure out how to collaborate. They couldn't figure out how to transfer requirements, explain what they needed. They couldn't figure out how to adapt their change. They, they could not redefine their path through the supply network graph. That's a big, huge problem because that's how everything breaks down. So COVID revealed all of these systemic problems with our global ability to coordinate and collaborate and generate a solution to this enormous shared human challenge. Uh, so these scattered attempts trying to do different things, there's a lot of repetitional work, an enormous amount of waste. It was inefficient, not just from a cost perspective, but from a time man hour perspective. And we don't have a lot when you really have a big problem. Uh, so all of these little, these little, this lack of interoperability contributed to a cascade waterfall kind of breakdown of things. And as we all know, it took 12 months or 16 months to sort out. Uh, uh, the next is that now is the time the world is really looking at what sustainability looks like going forward in the context of climate change. And that's really a very big deal. So organizations are pivoting to observe ESG uh, uh, you know, concerns. And again, we look at that if you lens it out even further again across the ecological, biological, social, cultural, governmental, and economic balance sheets. And uh, so what we're really trying to position ourselves to do is become a non-aligned platform, if you will, to enable all of this innovation and for supply to meet demand from, from solution generation to deployment. Next, please. Our goals are really very simple and straightforward. We incubate these open engineering driven solutions and see them deployed with the kind of rigor that they need to address respective demand across regions. That really compliance really matters here in the way that it works because you can take a great solution, for example, in a ventilator, but not everybody should make one, all right? Because if you make a bad one, you will kill somebody and that's a bad thing. So how you trace where that thing goes really matters to make sure it's a responsible entity seeing it. It doesn't mean it's not open. You want people to see and learn how to do it, but you also want to make sure that they're capable of producing it in, in, a, in a responsible manner. This is even more true if we're talking about a pharmaceutical or more true if we're talking about aerospace, uh, you know, a car, a power plant. Uh, you know, not everybody can take these things on. It's fine to learn about them, but you have to have a certain capacity and capability to be able to do it. Uh, we also look to really build collectives to rapidly do these things in local regions that enables the kind of infrastructure development I was talking about that's so important. And to, we wanna see this happen at scale because again, everybody needs these same basic things. And finally, the generation, the creation and the development of processes and solutions that enable the application of these newer existing technologies. So what is this off the shelf? How can it be repurposed? How can maybe in the context of the pandemic, a particular motor that we ran out of, oh, if we just change this little thing, how do we rapidly figure out that we can do that so that we can get back up and running on a production line, for example? 
Uh, next slide, please. We use a lot of uh, prominent relationships to get these things done. Uh, we've learned a lot from these folks. Uh, it really matters where you source your solutions, find your partners, who do you trust to get things done. Uh, so the current landscape lacks a real integration of these different, these different partnerships, and these, ele these elements, uh, which greatly handicaps the generation, the breadth, speed, and the impactability of ideas. We see things happening in this space, whether it's the hybrid public-private partnerships that now exist coming out of like, for example, BARDA, DARPA, but uh, in, in the open space, there isn't enough of this yet. And it doesn't exist at scale yet with engagement from industry and from, 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 private, uh, from private finance. So, um, Next, please. Our key assets that really drive the way this works and the way that we're able to do what we have been able to do have been not just these relationships, impactful external organizations and the, the sourcing and realization channels that have enabled the innovation to meet market, but uh, all of this has built credibility around the solutions and it's Thank you, Shane, for, for bringing us here because we've been able to work with some wonderful folks. Uh, Andrew's gone, of course, but he's been advising us on our version of an open source license. Uh, uh, but the breadth and quality of the community that's come together and stuck this out uh, uh, and has really been really very valuable to making these things happen, to deliver aid effectively with the frameworks that I've mentioned, that traceability that is so important. Uh, our, prop, our pipeline, uh, which is really significant and we're really looking to build out that again, everybody really needs to do to, there's so much value in transitioning to an open engineering model, but you have to do it in a way that everybody agrees upon and people really like differentiating. That's part of what they see as their value prop. And it's a challenge when it comes to the context of delivering aid, because the more you differentiate, the more difficult it is to interoperate. I'm reminded of an anecdote about a hospital system uh, that, uh, for every dollar that's spent, $10,000 are expected to be realized by a manufacturer, and they have to spend another 100 to deliver. Um, so all of these, you want to reduce some of those costs so that you can expand the availability of these things to people that really need them, and you want to be able to do it in a really quick fashion. Next, and we're going to get to the real, the real meat of the thing, which is the traceability around this. Uh, we can pass this one, Shane, in the interest of time. So the challenges that we really found as we go through supply chain, delivering a complex regulated artifact is that different entities using different nomenclature, schema, formats, methodologies, there's a mismatch between them and an inability to interoperate, and this extends to IP and traceability. There's been a lot of great thought done at Linux, particularly in the open logic, and I know that that exists and permeates throughout many of the technologies and traceability that exist. But these, all of these different solutions that may have different use cases that may be interoperable somewhere else, and really they have to come back right now you have a design and a bill of materials that's not enough when you're moving a regulated artifact or one that needs to be we think of regulate a regu you know if we're really looking for efficiency in this space you also need to move your initial risk register and design control relative to a reference design and all of that documentation has to be done and you need tooling around being able to produce all of that quickly. If this exists in an open framework and an open environment that people can rapidly collaborate, resulting in these reference designs and artifacts that are well designed and organized in a consistent way for regulatory. And along with a testing result for that rest, that, that, that reference design, then you have something, then you can move a piece of of, of aid or a solution quickly from one place to another and have a starting point that people can work off of. This is really quite consistently with how, uh, in some respects, medical already and pharma already work with this concept of a master file, where they keep some open, some pieces closed, but from there, they're able to build off of one another. And that's a large part of what open source really is. Uh, and so the last slide that I have for you shows a little bit about what this stack would look like, which is if we work off some core IP development tools, 
move this into IP, resulting in some concurrent license governance and compliance practices. And then for each sector, address the particular requirements that go with each sector's regulatory entities can interoperate. And really then it's just about them putting their interface, their business logic on it and delivering a quality experience to the person that needs it, whether that's aid or it's a market customer. So that's what we do. And this is the kind of the lessons that we've learned. And it's why all of this is, is especially in the context of a really fast moving space, you gotta have your ducks in a row and, and your IP tight. And you need to figure out who's even in an open environment, who's downloading it and, and what do they do with it? Because are they giving back what they're supposed to? That's what I got. Thanks for having us. Uh, so can you give us a little peek into the compliance issue? You had a case study, right? <laughs> well, I mentioned it at the beginning. As I said, we had a, a very simple face shield design that was created at the very beginning of the pandemic. It was the first thing to market. And interestingly enough, it's the cheapest thing that's been made. These things are about a buck a unit. Uh, you know, they cost significantly less than that to, to produce. And, you know, the thing was released under a CERN license. Um, and, uh, you know, and 18 months later, we figured out that many, many, many millions of these things have been made, but some of these people that made them did what they were supposed to do. They observed the terms of the license. And it seems that there's a couple entities that made many of these things and maybe they didn't. And we're figuring out right now if that was a deliberate over, you know, it was a deliberate or was it an accidental oversight? But now you have to work through how you resolve it because it, it you know, the, it, an open source license is an agreement and you have to abide by it. You have to stand up for it because that's the framework that you're choosing to work in. And it's not something you let slide. Nobody did this for the money, but they did it for the credit. But you take the credit away from them, you're breaking the contract. So right now we're in this interesting place. You know, we've never confronted any of this before. Uh, none of us have ever seen anything quite go like this. And we're trying to learn how to sort this one out. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, you know, I, I'm curious to hear what you think we should do. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, in the open source community, we've generally found that there's a, a sequence of events that usually happen in well-managed situations, which is where someone might have made a mistake regarding licensing, they should have a contact point and discuss with them. So lots of our companies in the ecosystem have something like open source at company.com. Uh, and that's the contact point for external. And that usually goes to the open source program office and the company then begins to uh, process that, check out what happened. Uh, in terms of open source software, the vast majority of compliance issues uh, we found simply be mistakes uh, where people didn't understand what the licenses meant. And of course, the license holder has the option to use cease and desist to prevent the organization continuing to uh, utilize whatever that technology is. Uh, when it comes to something where let's say the parties might have no idea how to manage open source and they're completely left field, uh, the recommended contact point would probably be legal on their side and just to flag a copyright infringement um, and, and then legal will begin to process it. Uh, but it, it all depends on a company responding to contact. And uh, if a company is non-responsive, uh, what we've generally seen in the community is uh, legal counsel sending a formal cease and desist letter to their legal department. This is pretty, this is pretty consistent with what we more or less figured would happen. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it seems really very straightforward, but uh, what's interesting in the, and it's my anticipation that this is all just a big understand, misunderstanding, but it's an interesting story relevant to this and how would we solve it going forward in the future? And I think the way we would do it if we weren't building the car as it flew down the road at 200 miles an hour before we had any wheels, which is what we had to do. I mean, it hit 13,000 people in three weeks and already that design is out there. You're still trying to figure out how to get everybody to work and what your infrastructure actually needs to be. Um, 
we would be using, and this is the direction that we will almost certainly be going in, uh, uh, we will be using a, a system obviously where you register to do your download so that we know where something went. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not open just because you have to put your name down, but this is actually really important when you're talking about um, uh, who's looking or, or who's deploying or what's happening to a regulated artifact. You wanna make sure that somebody who's making the thing really understands what they're doing and that they know how to do the thing right. That they're, uh, because you need to protect the integrity of the reference design one of the worst things that could happen is somebody take it, make a modification to it, not test it or not return it with the test, proving that their implementation of it meets uh, standard of care, for example. That would be a bad thing because then you, then you, you devalue uh, the point of the reference design, but you also you know, potentially see people put at risk. Um, you know, it's one of the big things in medical is it's something be safe and efficacious. Uh, and 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 that remain that's certainly true whether you know in in anything that is done uh, with regard to healthcare. Um, so I, it's one of the reasons that I think that really strong open compliance is such an important thing, and that kind of traceability exists. We've always imagined uh, a, a solution down the line where it's that right down to the feature of the thing that you can then reconfigure in a modular way these things are done so that you can put together the solution that's appropriate for your specific use case and don't have to redo a bunch of work. Um, and we'd like to see that happen because at the end of the day, we can envision a, a, you know, a successful ecosystem around this, around the world where you have just a bigger talent pool. You learn a bunch from people working around the limitations or constraints of their environment or their manufacturing capability. You get a bunch of information back, that's great. And if you have an, a question around something, you can go find that person, that individual who contributed to the thing and ask them the question. And that becomes the exchange of value in the thing. But because we look, we all stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before, right? So that's well, I can, we look at it. I can give you a tip. Um, we have an issue in Japan where uh, smart technology, smart homes, smart infrastructure uh, contains open source, like my air conditioner above my head uses open source, and it's uh, connected to my house, which is running on open source. But in Japan, it is impossible to allow people to install um, a variant on your air conditioner, your house sensor, your solar control, uh, because the company remains liable by Japanese law. So essentially, you know, they have to use GPL2 code and um, DRM because otherwise uh, they would be liable for whatever people might do. So in, in this particular space, uh, companies like Panasonic may be able to assist you, Benjamin, in getting the idea of how they went through this path of balancing open source, of balancing access to technology and doing it in the context of complex IPR. So I'll, I'll put you in contact with the Japan group and we'll take it from there. That'd be wonderful. Thanks, Shane. All righty, let's wrap it up there. Benjamin, thank you very much. Uh, we still have 16 people on the call. That is fantastic. Um, thank you for being on, I think, our longest call yet. Uh, we're, we're very- <laughs> Probably my <we're>, fault. <laughs> not at all. We had two large presentations in one day. Uh, Sebastian just asked, is there any time for questions? Go for it, Sebastian. You are automatically muted. Oh, you've written it down. Uh, so Sebastian's asking if the helpful engineering has a way to include member projects as part of the nonprofit. Um, and he just cites that Software Freedom Conservancy does that. Uh, it's also essentially what Linux Foundation or Eclipse does. That, you know, there's a legal entity and projects can be under that and that helps with finances. Benjamin, do you have that service for you know, G&A for projects that might come under your wing? Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, that is something that, 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 that we do do. Um, you know, we came at this from you know, starting from nothing. So it began with no entities. It just began with projects and people thinking that they could just put out a design and that's all that it would take to be helpful. But the reality is, is that if you want a solution that you put together to actually go reach the end user and be useful, 
eventually the whole thing has to get wrapped up into an entity to manage liability package risk. And so we began to spin off stuff. And we've had a number of spinoffs, both not-for-profits and for-profits that have gone on to, you know, to reach market and do their thing, whether these were nonprofits that were, for example, manufacturing that face shield I discussed, another one that produced a respirator. So we have one model that moves a project that just began as a group of individuals. And then when they reach a certain point of maturity, we help them package up into an entity if that's what the, that team wants to do. Or we can take in, we can work with an already existing project that wants to come and simply wants to get the tooling. It's very much the same way. It's interesting, you know, I didn't actually know prior to the way we conceived this that Linux very much worked this way, the Linux Foundation. And it's interesting to have arrived at the, at the same conclusion that it's the best way to work. <laughs> But yeah, we look at it as a federation type model and, and you know, look, there's the things that we can do and provide, but nobody really necessarily does everything. You want as many stakeholders, you want as much input on a project, on a solution, uh, whatever it is to make it stronger because you're always gonna learn something. And the more you do with that, the stronger the thing is gonna be, the better your business case uh, and maybe the more opportunities you have to pursue when the thing does go out into the world to be useful, whether that's uh, you know in a commercial context or in the context of a piece of aid, which should actually kind of have a commercial context because they look for, they look for that dollar to be sustainable and sustainable the way government or a funder thinks about it is, hey, yeah, this thing is going to go there. And it's not only, and it's going to build capacity. And part of that capacity thought is that it includes jobs, creation of infrastructure. Thank Great. you very much for your answer. Thank you very much for your answer, Benjamin. And it's really interesting to see that you have both approaches as part of your mission. Well, you know, we, we look at it from a fluid perspective is really, I think, kind of one of the better ways to do it. It's an ecosystem. And, uh, you know, ecosystems, you know, things move in and out of ecosystems in some respects, they can transition uh, from one to another. But, um, uh, you know, th the problem is, is when you come too rigid, things break. And you don't want things to break, you want them to be able to go with the flow. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and good luck, Benjamin, with your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benjamin. Now, we're going to wrap it up there. This has uh, been packed full of information. There is going to be a recording, so you can review the vast amount of stuff we've covered. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in exploring more on these topics, take it to our mailing lists. All of the parties that can answer questions are there. We are having our next event in approximately 11 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, it's now nearly midnight in China. It's gone midnight in Japan. At 11 a.m. China time, we have a Open Train China workgroup meeting where we're going to do a nice formal announcement. Who wants a preview of the announcement? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna check. King, can I give a preview of the announcement? Okay. Um, so in Approximately 11 hours, we'll be formally announcing that Huawei is joining the Open Chain Board. Um, and naturally, that is a huge step forward in the Chinese market, but also in our global activities. You're going to find out the details of that uh, via our news posts, our blogs, social media. And of course, over time, as we communicate various aspects of the collaboration, what you can expect, as you can see from the Harmony uh, presentation today is that Huawei is all in on building global communities at a scale um, that equals the largest we've ever seen. So you can expect us to be doing a lot of stuff in collaboration with Huawei and our other board member in China, Oppo, uh, to bring a lot more Chinese companies right to the forefront of leading the global uh, community. That's it, that's your reward for sticking by. You get the major news a couple of hours early. You know to watch the news services to see the quotes and details. Um, if you have time, 
on this room, as usual, we'll hold the Chinese meeting at uh, 11 China Standard Time in the morning. And if you're in the rest of the world, several of you are on vacation. Thank you for being here. Thank you for presenting. Be well, be safe, stay healthy, and good day all. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone.